This week's Parsha is Parshas Hazinu, one of the shortest Parshas in the Torah coming in at 52 Pesukim. If you'd like to follow along, we're going to be studying something that is almost at the end of the Parsha. I'm starting on Perak Memches, start, excuse me, starting on Perak Lamed Beis, Pesuk Memches, by Yedaber Hashem al Moshe. So just to set this up, again, very briefly, um, Moshe Rabbeinu is on the last day of his life. Moshe Rabbeinu is just about concluded uh, giving his final remarks, rebuking the Eden for the past, preparing them for their upcoming journey into Eretz Yisrael. And at this point, there is a break in Moshe's words to the Jewish people, and the Torah switches the narrative, and this time, it's Hashem that speaks to Moshe. So again, Perak Lamed Beis, Posuk Memches. Vaidabra Hashem al Moshe. Hashem spoke to Moshe. Be'etzem hayoim hazeh. Be'etzem hayoim hazeh. On that very day, Lamer Hashem said to him, Posuk Memtes, Alei al Har Ho'avorim hazeh. Ascend up on this mountain. Har Nevoi, called Mount Nevoi, or the mountain of Nevoi. Asher Beretz Moyov, it was in the land of Moyov, which I, today I believe is Iraq. Asher Al Pnei Yerecha, Yerei Yaser, it's Canaan. Hashem says to him, you'll take a look at the land of Canaan. Asher Ani Noisin Livnei Yisrael Achuzah, that I'm giving the Jewish people as an inheritance. And after, at the top of the mountain, you take a look at the land of Eretz Yisrael. Next, Posuk Nun, Umus, Hashem says to Moshe, and you will perish, you will die. Bohor Asher Ato Oil Shama, on that mountain that you go up. And you will be gathered to your people, which is a Torah expression for one who passes. Just as Aaron, your brother, died, and you'll be gathered to your people. And Hashem goes on to once again remind Moshe Rabbeinu why it is that he was going to perish in the Midbar and actually not go into Eretz Yisrael, but that's not for today. I want to study with you today a Rashi on the words, Be'etzem hayoim hazeh. So again... The Rashi is on Perak Lamed Beis, Posuk Memches. This instruction of Hashem to Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moshe go up on the mountain, take a look at Eretz Yisrael, and then pass on. The Torah says that this instruction was given by Hashem to Moshe Rabbeinu, Be'etzem hayoim hazeh. In my English, the words Be'etzem hayoim hazeh are translated as on that very day. Now, of course, this needs to be understood. What do you mean on that very day? If I say that Hashem spoke to Moshe on that day, so he spoke to him on that day. What's on that very day? If he said he spoke to him on Monday, so he spoke to him on Monday. If he spoke to him on Tuesday, so he spoke to him on Tuesday. We already know that this is the day of Moshe Rabbeinu's passing because the Torah said beforehand, last, last week's Parsha, Parsha's Vayelach, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jews, Ben Meya Vesrim Shono Anoichi Hayoim. This was Moshe Rabbeinu's 120th birthday. Uh, which the Gemara calculates works out to be the seventh day of Adar. So this is the day. So this is the day that Hashem comes to Moshe and tells him, go up the mountain, take a look at Eretz Yisrael, and you'll pass there on the mountain. Everything has already been prearranged. We've been talking about this, that Moshe is not going into Eretz Yisrael and that he's going to see Eretz Yisrael and all the rest of it. This has all been discussed many, many times. And yet the Torah uses a new expression here that's never been used in the context of Moshe Avinu's passing. Be'etzem ha'yoyim hazeh. So on the words, Be'etzem HaYoyim Hazeh, there's actually a lengthy Rashi. I'm not going to read the whole thing inside. Um, Rashi says, B'Shloisha Mekoymois Nemar Be'etzem HaYoyim Hazeh. Rashi says this expression, Be'etzem HaYoyim Hazeh, is used in three places in the Torah. One, the first time it's used, says Rashi, was when Noyach goes into the Teva. This is Parsha Hazinu, is the second last Parsha in the Torah. Parshas Noach is the second, the very second parsha of the Torah. And there the Torah says, Be'etzem hayoim hazeh bo Noach, that it was on that very day that Noach entered the Torah. That was the first time the Torah uses the word, the expression, Be'etzem hayoim hazeh. The second time the Torah uses the expression, Be'etzem hayoim hazeh, when the Jewish people left Mitzrayim. The Pesach says in Parshas, Boy, Hashem Hashem took the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, Be'etzem, and the essence of that day. And here, uh, in, when, it, when it comes to the passing of Moshe, once again, Be'etzem, on the essence of that day. 
Before I go on, because maybe some of you are wondering about this because the commentaries do talk about this, there is a fourth time where the Torah talks about the Torah uses the expression and that is in Parshas Lech Lecha, the third parsha in the Torah, where Avram Avinu gives, a bris, gives himself a bris milah. And over there, once again, the Torah uses the expression the commentaries do discuss why Rashi ignores that fourth time the Torah uses the expression. I don't believe we're going to get into that today. Um, I, just want, I just want to mention the question and to tell you the commentaries do talk about it. Rashi makes it seem, as far as this, in this context, as if the expression is only three times. Noyach, when the Jewish people leave Mitzrayim and by the passing of Moshe Rabbein. Why, says Rashi? In all three cases, it's for the same reason. Here's Rashi's explanation. Because when the people of Noyach's generation saw Noyach building a table, and they heard from him that he was intending to go into the table when Hashem was going to flood the world, the people of, no of Noyach's generation swore to him up and down that this was never going to happen on their watch. They said to Noyach, never going to happen. Nah. -uh. We will not allow you to enter that Teva. If, in fact, it's true, as you say, that a flood is coming, and if it's true, in fact, as you say, that the entire world is going to get destroyed, my dear friend Noyach, we are not going to let you go into the Teva. Not only that, we're going to destroy it. All right? After 120 years, construction is finally concluded. If any of you have done renovations in your home, uh, you'll know that renovations and construction takes longer than people usually anticipate. 120 years later, the, the construction is concluded, and one day it starts raining. And Noyach takes his family, and they go into the Teva. Wait a second, says the Torah. He didn't just go into the Teva on the day that it started raining. He went in Be'etzem Hayoim Hazer. What's Be'etzem Hayoim Hazer? This was the Rabboina Shalolam's response to all the scoffers and mockers and all of the naysayers, the cynics and the sarcastic individuals who mocked and ridiculed and denigrated Noyach for all these years and all this time and said, if the, if the flood ever comes, we're not going to let you into the Teva. Hashem was the one who had the final say. Because at the 11th hour, when it was time for Noyach to go in, Hashem said, right, I'm taking him in. And in the middle of the day, when the sun is at its peak, Noyach marched together with his family in plain and open view of everybody, right into the Teva of Ayiskar Hashem Ba'adoi, and Hashem closed the door behind him. But Hashem made sure to say that this happened, meaning to say, there was nothing about this that was hidden or concealed. It was done by Farhesya Uborabim. It was Hashem's way of saying, I'm going to do this in your face. Let's see all of you, Groysa, uh, all of you big heroes who threatened that you'd never let this happen. Let's see you do something now. And of course, nobody did anything. That's why the expression is used by Noyach to tell us that this happened in the middle of the day without fear. Noyach entered the table without fear, without intimidation. Hashem took him by the hand, so to speak, and took him into the table. When it comes to the Jew, that's the first time the Torah uses When it comes to the Jewish people leaving Mitzrayim, says Rashi, same story, same story. The Egyptians were already hearing for a while that the Jews have plans to go out of Mitzrayim. The Egyptians were hearing that they have all these, they believe Hashem is going to redeem them and they're going to go out and they're going to... And so the Jewish people, the slave owners, the, the, the brutes, the abusers, they would look at the Jews, then they would say, you're not going anywhere. Where do you think you're going? And if you ever try, we won't let you go out, and in fact, we'll kill you. So, what are you even thinking? Once again, they were quick to, to, to denigrate, to be cynical, and to sarcastically mock the Jews that their hour of redemption would never come. But their hour of redemption did come. And Hashem did take the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, and they did become free men and women. Wait a second, says the Torah. But when Hashem took the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, He took them out. It was in the middle of the day, when the sun is at its peak, in plain view, 
and it was the Rabbeinu Shlomo who had the last say. Where the Rabbeinu Shlomo took them out of Mitzrayim in broad daylight and said, so to speak, to the Egyptians, come on, I challenge you. You've been saying for years, for decades, maybe for centuries, that if the Jewish people even ever even attempt Exodus, you would prevent it, you would wipe them out, God forbid. No, do something. Ah, Hashem exposed them for what they are. A bunch of cowards, scared. Big talkers. The Jewish people left Mitzrayim. Here's where the Rashi gets plain weird. I shouldn't say that. Here's where the Rashi gets very difficult to understand. Concludes Rashi, the same is true when it comes to the passing of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Jewish people who were anticipating, Moshe had been telling them that he wasn't going to take them into Eretz role, he was going to pass on. And the Jewish people said, not on our watch, we're never going to let this happen. Odom Mitzrayim, the man who took us out of Egypt and split the sea and gave us Mon and Slav and gave us the Torah. We're not going to let him die. No way. And so the Torah concludes, When Moshe Rabbeinu's time came, Hashem said to Moshe, I'm taking you up to the top of the mountain. We're doing it in the middle of the day, broad daylight. Let everybody see that I, Hashem, am going to do exactly what I said and nobody can stop me. I'm not hiding anything. It was as if Hashem was, so to speak, challenging the Jews and saying, come on. In exactly the same way he did to the Goyim who threatened Noyach and the Egyptians who threatened the Jews in Mitzrayim, Hashem said, it's Moshe Rabbeinu's hour. Anybody going to stop me? Of course not. And so in the middle of the day, Moshe Rabbeinu went up on this mountain, Har Nevoi, gazed upon the land of Eretz Yisrael and returned his holy neshama to our Father in heaven. End of Rashi. And every commentator on Rashi or on Chumash sitting there scratching their heads, trying to understand what in heaven's name Rashi is saying. Let's break it down because there's about four or five questions here. Question number one. I can understand why the Goyim in Noyach's day thought they were going to prevent Noyach from going into the Teva. I can kind of get that. They thought they were going to get in his way. They thought they were going to block his road. They said, we'll just destroy the Teva. We don't care how long it took you to build it. 120 years, Mazel Tov. Jews aren't great at, at construction. We'll just destroy it. I can understand how the Goyim anticipated what they were going to do. I can understand how the Goyim in Mitzrayim thought, anticipated they weren't going to prevent the Jews from leaving Mitzrayim. They said, we'll get in their way. We'll kill them if we have to. But who in heaven's name is ever going to prevent another human being from passing on? What were the Jews thinking? That Moshe Rabbeinu's hour has come and they're going to prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from dying? Every human being that's born until the coming of Mashiach at some point must meet his or her own mortality. What did they think they were going to do? Do CPR on Moshe Rabbeinu? Until what? In other words, the whole premise seems preposterous. How do you prevent someone from dying? You can prevent someone from entering a building. You can prevent somebody from going from one place to the other. How do you prevent someone from, we can prolong life. We can, we can do our best. We can administer medicine. We can, we can keep a person healthy for as long as please God possible till 120 plus tax. But at some point, every human being must meet their maker. Every living thing that comes into life until the coming of Mashiach must meet its end. Question number one. How did the Jews even think they were going to prevent the passing of Moshe Rabbein? Question number two. Are we really comparing the Jews trying to prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from dying to the Goyim preventing Noyach from entering the Teva and, and, and the Goyim preventing the Jews from leaving Mitzrayim? Rabbeinu Shalom, Shalom. What kind of a comparison is this? Why, why would we want to compare? Why would the Torah do that? Why would the Torah want to compare the Am HaNivchar, Hashem's chosen nation, to their own captors who refused to free them from Mitzrayim? Why, why compare? Why, put, why paint them with the same, 
with the same stroke of the same paintbrush. Why? Well, that's what Rashi's saying. Just like the Goyim wanted to prevent Noyach and the Jews from leaving Mitzrayim, the Jews wanted to prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from... What? Why say it that way? Why does the Torah want to draw a comparison between the Goyim who refused to le- let the Jews leave Mitzrayim to the Jews themselves who refused to let Moshe Rabbeinu go? That's question number two. Question number three. If it was the will of Hashem that Moshe Rabbeinu pass, and clearly it was, then forget about comparing the Jews to the Goyim or not comparing the Jews to the Goyim. The Jews on their own. Why would they want to do that? Didn't they understand that this was the will of Hashem? Yes, a painful will of Hashem. Yes, we wish it was different. But at some point, you have to accept that this is what Hashem wants. Surely at this stage, after Moshe Rabbeinu had prepared them and lived for 120 years and accomplished everything he was supposed to do, there was nothing left for Moshe Rabbeinu to do. Couldn't the Jews understand that it was the will of Hashem that that Moshe Rabbeinu pass? Why did they want to fight? First of all, how could they fight it? Second of all, why are we comparing their willingness to fight it to the Goyim's willingness to fight it? And Bechlal in general. The Jews want to fight. It, it seems like the Torah is putting the Jews here in a position where they're wrestling with the will of God. Hashem said, this is what I want. What, you know better? Hashem said, it's time for Mo- it's Moshe Rabbeinu's hour. Time for Moshe Rabbeinu to go. No, they didn't say, we want him to live. All right, everybody wants Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu himself wants to live. He wants to go to Territ Yisrael, no? But Hashem said, no. No means no. Why did the Jews want to prevent Moshe Rabbeinu's passing. That's question three. Question four. When you read this Rashi, you would think that the Jews and Moshe Rabbeinu had some fantastic love affair going on, and the Jews couldn't bear the thought of Moshe Rabbeinu dying. Actually, the Jews and Moshe Rabbeinu had a very complicated relationship. (laughs) Till Moshe Rabbeinu's dying day, he's still giving them Musa, and he's still giving it to them over the head, and he's still telling them, remember when you complained about this, and remember, remember when you did that? Theirs was a, was a difficult, difficult relationship. It's not for today's, she- the following point is not for today's shear to elaborate on, but the Gemara says that things got so bad between Moshe and the Jews, the Jews made such heinous accusations against Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moshe Rabbeinu actually relocated himself outside of the Jewish camp. I mean, they accused Moshe Rabbeinu of theft, of immorality, of incest, of cheating on his wife, of cheating with their own wives. I mean, it was not exactly a romantic 40 years between the two of them. No? Now Moshe Rabbeinu's done his bidding, it's over? All of a sudden they wake up, wait! We're not going to let Moshe Rabbeinu die. We're going to fight nature. We're going to fight God. We're going to line ourselves up with the Mitzrayim and Mitzrayim. We're not going to let it happen. Surprising. What were they hoping for by keeping Moshe Rabbeinu around? 40 more years, 40 more years of strife. Huh? I mean, the things they said, you read the Pesukim, the things these Jewish people said to Moshe Rabbeinu, it's hair-raising. At one stage, they turn to Moshe Rabbeinu and they say, you took us to die in the desert. Why? There are not enough graves in Mitzrayim. I mean, at one stage, there was a full-on rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu, led by Koirach, granted. But the Torah says Koirach had support from the entire Jewish nation. All of a sudden, comes Moshe Rabbeinu's time. Oh, everybody wakes up. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We're going to let Moshe Rabbeinu... Are you kidding me? We're going to let Moshe Rabbeinu die? The man who took us out of Mitzrayim, the man who split the sea, the man who gave us Mon and Slav and gave us the Torah... You want to laugh when you read this. Rabbeinu Shalom, now you wake up. Now, on his, literally on his yard site. Where were you for 40 years? Why didn't you scream 20, 30, 40 years ago? The man who took us out of Mitzrayim and gave us the Torah for 40 years and nothing. Comes the end of time, they wake up. Oh, now they're not going to let him die. This seems difficult to understand as well. 
And finally, question number five, I think is the strongest question of them all. Says the Torah, Hashem anticipated all of this. Hashem anticipated that the Jews didn't want Moshe Rabbeinu to die. Hashem anticipated that, that the Jewish people said, we're not going to let this happen. And Hashem said, really? I challenge you. Watch. I, Hashem, am going to take this man, Moshe Rabbeinu, to the top of the mountain in the middle of the day, and there he'll die. And nobody can stop me. Wow. Really? That's Hashem's response to the Jewish people wanting Moshe Rabbeinu to live? To, to sort of get in their faces? The same way, to respond the same way he did to the Goyim in Mitzrayim, to the Goyim in the days of Noach, and say, you can't stop me. I'm more powerful than you. It, it seems almost, I don't want to use the word immature, it seems almost cruel. Like, this is where Hashem, this is how Hashem chooses to show us how almighty and, mighty and powerful he is. Nobody can stop me from killing Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm going to do it in your faces. Seems like a painful, difficult, almost unnecessary thing, why for Hashem to respond. If for whatever reason the Jews thought they could prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from dying. And if for whatever reason they did wake up on his final day and say, no, no, we don't want him to go. And, and, and even if for whatever reason they, they, they somehow managed to rationalize this and, 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 and not, not have it go against the, way of, the will of Hashem. And even if for, for some reason we want to line this up with... Hashem could have looked at the Jews and said, look, I'm, I'm so sorry. His time has come. Quietly taken Moshe Rabbeinu to the side, laid him to rest, and that would have been the end of it. Oh, no, says the Torah. Oh no, make no mistake. This was done in broad daylight. Almighty God himself put his foot down. He drew the line in the sand. He said, these are my principles. Time for Moshe Rabbeinu to go. And he did. End of story. Why would the Rabbeinu Shalom choose to make this his holy grail with a capital H? Why would he choose to, to make a point out of this? It seems, like, it seems like he was sort of getting in the face of the Jews on the wrong issue. Okay. Again, I want to summarize the questions very briefly. Question number one, how did the Jews think they were going to prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from dying? You can't prevent anybody from dying. Question number two, why is the Torah comparing them to the Goyim who wanted to prevent Noyach from going into the Teva or the Goyim who wanted to prevent the Jews from going out of Mitzrayim? Why, make, why draw this comparison? Even if the Jews did somehow want or thought they could prevent Moshe from dying, why compare them to the Goyim in Mitzrayim, their own captors, their, their, own, their, their own abusers, their own people who beat them and, and, and threw their babies into the Nile River? Why compare them to the Jews? Why make that comparison? That's question two. Question number three, if this was the will of Hashem, why did the Jews not just simply accept it? Question number four, if the Jewish people were so appreciative of Moshe Rabbeinu, where have they been for the past 40 years? And question number five, why does Hashem choose the Dafka today, Zion Adar, Moshe Rabbeinu's Yorzeit, to show the Jews who's boss over this issue? Why is Hashem's reaction, question number five, why is Hashem's reaction so so forceful, so, so confrontational. He's getting confrontational with the Jews. No, he's telling the Jews, in the middle of the day, I'm taking Moshe Rabbeinu up to the mountain. Okay. So a couple of important points. Number one, first some, some, some I guess, technical points. Number one, the commentaries say that the Jewish people weren't planning to prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from dying by keeping him alive physically, they intended to prevent him from going up the mountain. You see, they found, this is Jewish, this is the Jewish way of thinking. They found a clause in Hashem's instructions because Hashem said to Moshe, go up the mountain and you'll die on top of the mountain. Now, you know how a Jew thinks, a Jew goes, a Jew thinks, wait a second. If Hashem told Moshe to go up the mountain and you'll die on top of the mountain, what if we prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from going up the mountain? 
then he can't die because Hashem said, you'll die on top of the mountain. What if we never let him go up the mountain? So it wasn't that they thought that they were going to find some kind of pill that they would make Moshe swallow that he would live forever, but they hoped or they believed or they wished that since Hashem had said, you, Moshe, are going to die on top of the mountain, they thought if we get in the way and we don't let him go up, he'll never die. As a child, I, I heard a, a, probably a, a parable um, about a man who's sentenced to death uh, in the presence of the king for whatever, you know, grievous uh, sin he had done. And, uh, you know, how all good stories go. Before he dies, they give him his last wish. So they say to the, the man, Nu, what's your last wish? He says, my last wish is I'd like a cup of water. That's it? Yeah, that's it. Just a cup of water. All right. They bring him a royal cup of water and he holds it in his hand. And as he's about to drink it, he says, your honor, he turns to the king. He says, your honor, I'm afraid that they're going to kill me before I finish drinking the water. The king goes, just drink the water. Nobody's going to touch you. He says, no, no, king, I cannot explain to you why, but for some important reason, it's absolutely critically important to me that I finish this water before anybody kills me. The king looks at the guy and says, I promise you, nobody will kill you before you finish the water. And with that, he takes the cup of water and tosses it across the room. Boom, gone, splattered all over the wall and floor, all over the walls and floor. And he says to the king, just remember, you promised nobody would touch me before I finished this cup of water. Now I can't drink it. And the king lets him go. All right, probably a Boba Misa, but nevertheless brings out the point. So in a similar sense, the commentaries, again, on a, on a technical level, the commentaries explained that the Jews hoped that if they could prevent Moshe Rabbeinu from going up the mountain, if they could prevent him from going up this Har, har, this har Nevoi, because Hashem had insisted that Moshe would die on top of the mountain, this way they would prevent Moshe Rabbeinu. But now let's get, to the, let's get to the soul of what's going on. What do the Jews want here? What are, what are they really saying? And why are they reacting this way when it comes time for Moshe Rabbeinu to die? So just for a moment, let's go back to the first time Moshe and the Jews really meet, the first time this, this thing gets going. The Jews are in Mitzrayim, and Moshe comes to them with a message of redemption. He tells them, Chevre, let's go. It's time to go. Hashem has sent me to take you out of Mitzrayim. Now the Torah says in, an, in, a, in, an, in a profoundly deep, even from a psych, it's easier to see, even from a psychological perspective, the depth in the Jewish people's response. The Torah says, V'loi shamu el Moshe. V'loi shamu el Moshe, as we've explained, doesn't mean that they didn't believe Moshe. It doesn't mean that they didn't they weren't inspired by Moshe. It doesn't mean that they didn't give him the time of day. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is that they didn't listen, or even better, they didn't hear, or even better, they couldn't. They couldn't hear what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying. Moshe came to them to tell them, it's time for you to be free men and women. And it was like he was talking to them in Chinese for those of you who don't speak Chinese. It was a language that didn't mean anything to them at all. Nothing. And this becomes the Shalom Aleichem that begins the relationship between the Jews and Moshe. In the end, they did become free. He did take them out of Mitzrayim. But it was something that was impossible for the Jews to picture. It was impossible for them to understand. It was impossible for them to wrap their heads around at least in terms of the way Moshe Ben was talking about it. He was talking to them about freedom when they really saw themselves as slaves. And basically, if you go through every step of the way, the journey between Moshe and the Jews, this is really what it boils down to. At every step of the way, Moshe is telling the Jews something about themselves. He's telling them, you're a free people. They don't know what he's talking about. They see themselves as slaves. He's telling them, you're a people that's going to survive every obstacle. The sea will split before you. Once again, their, their response is, you probably took us here because graves are cheaper. He tells them they're going to get mon from heaven. He tells them, Parnosa, Hashem is going to provide for them. He gives them the Torah. And at every step of the way, 
the Jewish people's reaction is all, can always be reduced to the same thing. It really is just a sense of disbelief or, or, or detachment. Moshe is telling them something. The Jews are having a very hard time absorbing what Moshe is saying. Why? Why is it so difficult to absorb or to hear even for the Jewish? It starts off with them not even being able to hear, physically hear the words of Moshe. In my own two and a half minutes of experience, I've learned that when you tell people things that are shocking, that are surprising to them, they'll sometimes turn to you and they'll go, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what did you just say? What? Or, or if they're not as polite, they'll go, huh? And, and it, it's not because they need you to repeat what you're saying louder. It's not because they need you to repeat what you're saying more clear. It's not that you're speaking the wrong language. It's just that the content of what's being said is, is not, it's not digestible in the mind of the person. And so they need you to say it again and again and, and until they even figure out what you're saying because it's so preposterous, like what? And this becomes the story of, of their relationship, Moshe Rabbeinu and the Jews. Turns out that Moshe came to take these people and make them a free Torah people who would live and thrive and survive forever. And every part of that message of Moshe Rabbeinu seemed completely impossible. It seemed ridiculous, ludicrous. I mean, he was talking to basically a, a family of slaves. And even when he finally did take them out of Mitzrayim, the Egyptians were hot in pursuit. All they saw in front of them was death and fear. But one after another, again after again, Moshe Rabbeinu perseveres. He liberates them. He saves them from the Egyptians. He saves them from the sea. He gives them food and water. And he even gives them the Torah. And the Jewish people become a spiritual and holy people. There's an expression in the Gemara that it takes 40 years for a student to understand the words of his teacher. So 40 years later, it seems, the penny drops and the Jewish people realize what Moshe Rabbeinu has been telling them from day one, which is that their existence as a Jewish people will be one which will defy the odds. They will be a people that is impossible to exist and yet they'll exist anyways. They will be a people that will be impossible for them to be free and yet they'll be free anyways. They will be people who will live in environments in which it will be impossible to study Torah. They'll study Torah anyways. They will find themselves in circumstances where it's impossible for them to eat, to make a living, and yet they'll make a living anyways. Moshe Rabbeinu's message to the Jews from the day he came into office till the day of his departing was always the same. He told the Jews, don't be fooled by the reality as you see it in front of you. Don't you see a groisa go? You see a big Egypt in front of you. You see a big Yamsuf in front of you. You see a desert in front of you. Don't be fooled, says Moshe, by any of this. You're bigger and you're stronger and you're connected to infinity. You have within you an Ashama. And over and over again, he's right. Lo and behold. It turns out Moshe Rabbeinu's message is in fact the truth. The Jewish people's existence is one of the miracles. It's not bound by nature in any way. And slowly it seems they get the message, or at least the next generation gets the message. And they're ready to go into Eretz Yisrael. They, they start to see themselves differently. It wasn't, you see, I think we sometimes misunderstand the story. It wasn't that they were bad people who wanted to fight with Moshe. It wasn't that they were rebellious and chutzpahdik and, and, and angry and bitter and resentful. And, and because of that, you know, they, they just thought Moshe took them into, each, into the desert because graves are cheaper there. They weren't choosing to be that way because they were angry. They were, they were, it was their default reaction because Moshe was telling them stuff that they didn't know what he was saying. It Moshe. Was, he was talking a language that they didn't relate to. He told them, Hashem loves you. 
You have within you infinite power. You're, you have an neshama. You're, you're a yid. You're, you'll survive forever. The Torah, that you'll, the Torah that you learn today will be studied in three and a half thousand years. You are the purpose of all of creation and the purpose of all of existence. And they looked at themselves and they said, huh, me? I'm a simple Jew. I'm trying to make a living. I'm trying to get out of Egypt. Every time Moshe came to them with a message, the Jews had a difficult time wrapping their heads around it. They thought he was not How do you go to a desert? How do you take two million, three million Jews into the desert without salami sandwiches? What are they going to eat? No problem, says Moshe. I'll make the food come down from heaven. Always the same problem. But here's the point, but he perseveres and he succeeds over and over and over again. And then comes the time of Moshe Rabbeinu's passing. And now there was a, now, now there was a problem. Because the Jewish people turn to Moshe and say, wait a second, wait a second, they say, wait a second. But if you die, if you Moshe Rabbeinu leave us, if, if we can no longer see you and hear you and wrestle and fight with you, who's going to be there to remind us who we are? Who's going to be there to tell us that we will persevere and we will live and we will thrive and we will do well and, and we will overcome every seemingly impossible obstacle in our way? What do you mean they came to Moshe Rabbeinu one day and said, what do you mean you're going away and never going to return? So then what? So we go back to being slaves in Egypt? You are our ticket to everything we have. We redefined ourselves and our lives. We, we're now free Torah Jews. You gave us the Torah min Hashemayim. You, we tried to hear it from Hashem. We couldn't. You gave it to us. Now you're going? So what happens now? Everything that you did and gave us and taught us, it's all gone. We can't let that happen. We can't let you go. We have to fight with you. As we fought with you during your life, we have to fight with you. We have to fight with you at your moment of death. If you go, they said to Moshe Rabbeinu, we lose everything. You remember what we were, they said to Moshe. You remember who we were before you came? We were abused slaves. We wanted to die in the desert or in Egypt. Before you came, we were nothing. Now that you built us up and elevated us and, and, and now that we're about to go into the promised land, now, now, now you disappear. Even when you're alive, they said to Moshe Rabbeinu, it's, it's, it's difficult enough to absorb your teachings. It's difficult enough to hold on to what you're saying. Now you go? We'll be left with nothing. We cannot let this happen. And so the Jews once again find themselves where the message that Moshe Rabbeinu is communicating to them seems impossible. Moshe Rabbeinu is telling them, you have to go on without me. Again, it's the same story all over again. Veloy Shamuel Moshe. They can't hear what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying. What do, you, what do you mean you're going to die and leave us here alone? What does that mean? It's just as preposterous as it was 40 years ago when Moshe came to them in Mitzrayim and said, it's time to be free. We're not free. We're slaves. They can't absorb it. It's, 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 you know, it's like, it's like a teacher who teach, teaches a class, but the lesson is, is too lofty for the students to understand what the teacher is saying. They said, Moshe Rabbeinu, it's 40 years. We're just finally now today understanding what you taught us 40 years ago. It's finally starting to click. And now you leave. And so the Torah articulates the response. Vayedaber Hashem al Moshe be'etzem ha'yoyim hazeh. Hashem took Moshe Rabbeinu in the middle of the day in the presence of the Jews, while every single one of them watched. And Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the mountain. 
never to be physically seen again. Why? Why? You see, because Moshe turned to the Jews and said, I'm not leaving you to fend for yourselves. I'm not leaving you alone. I'm not taking everything that I've taught you away from you. It's the exact opposite. Moshe Rabbeinu told the Jews, after 40 years of me telling you who you are, after 40 years of me telling you that you are Jews and you have the Torah and you can split the proverbial sea and you can get mana from heaven, after 40 years of me telling this to you, now, said Moshe Rabbeinu, it's your turn. Now I'm going to leave you, at least apparently, and you'll continue all of this alone. Not alone without me, but alone empowered. You see, there's a problem, said Moshe. As long as I'm here, as long as I'm telling you that you're free, as long as it's coming from me, you're still a slave. As long as you need me to tell you that you are free, you're still a slave. And as long as you need me to give you the Torah, you haven't mastered the Torah. And as long as you need me to, give, to split the sea for you, you're not truly liberated from fear. Instead, says Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu to the Jewish people, watch. I'm going to go up the mountain in the middle of the day. And as you'll see me climb up the mountain, you will tell yourselves not that Moshe Rabbeinu is gone forever, God forbid, but the exact opposite. You will say to yourselves, now every one of us is a little Moshe Rabbeinu. Now it's time for me to look at myself and say, okay, if Moshe Rabbeinu believed in me, then I can. If Moshe Rabbeinu taught us that we are Yidin, then we will study Torah and we will be free. And when we see obstacles that seem to us to be absolutely impossible, we will remember, even without the physical appearance, apparent appearance of a Moshe Rabbeinu, we will remember what he taught us and we will rise above the challenges. In fact, to put it in the words of the commentaries, Moshe Rabbeinu's passing was actually the greatest lesson he taught the Jews ever. Because in one swift moment and in one fine day, he taught the Jews that they truly were invincible. And that even if they didn't see him, they could remember what he taught them and learn to feel the empowerment that Moshe gave them from Hashem and be truly free, liberated Jews. It's like in the world of education, they like to say, what's the def definition between, what's the dif difference, excuse me, between a good teacher and an excellent teacher? A good teacher controls the classroom when the teacher is in the room. An excellent teacher controls the classroom even when the teacher leaves the room. A good teacher can have a fantastic class, can give a great cheer, and all the students can learn and give the teacher a standing ovation when the teacher is done. Excellent, bravo, amazing. But what happens when the teacher leaves? Oi, the students cry, gewalt. The teacher left, and now, and now garnished. And now garnished, if you're left with nothing, then the teacher hasn't truly empowered his students. He's done a half a job. Moshe Rabbeinu turned to the Jews at the foot of the mountain and said, you're not going to get in my way as I go up to the mountain because if you get in my way, you're getting in your own way. Get out of your own way. Let me go, said Moshe. I've given you everything that I need to give you. Now you have it. You don't need to continue receiving it in the same way you have until now. It's time for you to step up and see that you have within you the ability to rise above obstacles that you perceive to be impossible to overcome. And that's how, that's how they explain, that's how the commentaries explain this rush. I'm gonna go back and answer all the questions with Hashem's help and then I wanna explain 
how I think this is relevant to today. The first question we asked was, how were the Jews planning to prevent the death of Moshe Rabbeinu? The answer, they were, they were planning to prevent him from going up to the mountain in hopes that if they did, he wouldn't die because Hashem had stipulated that he would die at the top of the mountain. Question number two, why do we want to compare the Jewish people to the Goyim, to the Goyim in the times of Noach, to the Goyim in the times of Mitzrayim? Why do we want to compare the Jews to their own enemies? Why do we want to compare the Jews to, to, to their own captors, to, the, to the, their own people who, who enslaved them? And the answer is because this was the Jews enslaving themselves. When the Jews didn't want to let Moshe Rabbeinu go, they were self-sabotaging. They insisted that their freedom and that their Torah and, and, and that the way they perceived themselves was dependent upon the tangible Moshe Rabbeinu that they could see and feel. In that sense, perhaps spiritually, they turned into their own abusers. You see? It's very easy, or it's relatively easy, to liberate Noyach from a Goy, to liberate a Jew from a Mitzri. Very easy. What about the Noyach and the Mitzri that we carry in our own heads? What about the Goy inside our own heads who says, ah, you can't, and you won't, and you're too weak, and you're too small, and you're a slave, and you can never leave Mitzrayim? In a sense, the Jews are acting like those Mitzrayim, insisting that their freedom is dependent upon a tangible Moshe Rabbeinu. No, said Moshe Rabbeinu, no, you're wrong. Don't be a Mitzri. Don't tell yourself you're a slave. You're not a slave, you're free. Let yourself go. Yes, their inability to see their strength, even without an apparent and visible Moshe Rabbeinu was the cause, was their own limitation that they had to overcome, just like Noach had to overcome his, his enemies and the Jews had to leave Mitzrayim. Question number three, we asked, why did the Jews want to disobey the will of Hashem? If Hashem said it's time for Moshe to die, doesn't that mean that they should let Moshe go? The answer is obvious. The answer is they weren't trying to disobey Hashem. They just couldn't fathom a world of being Torah observant Jews without a Moshe, without their teacher. Question number four, we asked, why did the Jews wake up now? They didn't seem to love Moshe. They didn't seem to enjoy everything over the years. Well, the answer is they didn't wrestle with Moshe Rabbeinu because they hated him. They wrestled with Moshe Rabbeinu because what he was saying was so difficult. It was so difficult for them to see themselves differently. But like a challenging teacher, they loved it. And every time they rose to the challenge. And now the greatest challenge of them all, they had to let Moshe Rabbeinu go. Most difficult of them. Question number five, why does Hashem get so confrontational with them? Why does Hashem force Moshe Rabbeinu up the mountain in the middle of the day? The answer is because this was the greatest lesson and the greatest obstacle that the Jewish people had to overcome. Yes, Hashem wanted every Jew to stand there and watch Moshe go up the mountain. And know that Moshe wouldn't come down, not because Hashem was, God forbid, torturing the Jews, but because Hashem was liberating the Jews. He needed them to understand, to carry that message of Moshe Rabbeinu within themselves, that, that little, what Hasidus calls, that little Moshe Rabbeinu within every one of them. And so, yes, that lesson was given by Hashem to, Moshe, to the Jewish people as Moshe Rabbeinu walked up the mountain. I'll tell you a quick story that I heard the other day. I grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa. I didn't know this till actually yesterday, but apparently in the 70s, some of the leaders of the Jewish community in South Africa wrote a letter to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, in Crown Heights. And they said, Rebbe, they were bemoaning the situation in South Africa. There was political unrest, there was economic unrest, there was Lots of fear of civil war in those days. And the Jewish people, were, and there were many Jews were emigrating, were, were leaving South Africa, going all over Australia, Israel, United States. Many of them settled in San Diego. Maybe some, maybe some of them are here today on the Shear. And the letter began with the words, Rebbe, the Jewish community in South Africa is a dying community with diminishing resources. <laughs> Sound Jewish? 
Rebbe, it's a dying community with diminishing resources. I'm reminded of that fantastic joke. If the joke wasn't in the letter, I'm adding it, about uh, the difference between a Jewish pessimist and a Jewish optimist. And the Jewish pessimist tells the Jewish optimist, things are so bad, they can never get worse. We've reached the end of our rope. This is it. It's a disaster. Everything is going to you know what in a basket. We're finished. And the Jewish optimist turns to the Jewish pessimist with disgust. What is wrong with you? Have some faith. Have you abandoned your people and forgotten anything from Jewish history? Fair. You say it can't get worse? I say, said the optimist, I'm an optimist. I say, of course it could get worse. You say tomorrow will bring no change. I say, of course it will bring, of course it could get worse. Have some faith. I'm optimistic. It'll get worse. They wrote to the Rebbe, Rebbe, it's a dying community, diminishing resources. Rebbe, shalom, help. Among the many things the Rebbe wrote back, he wrote to them, learn something from Jewish history. The Jewish people have been through this so many times. Ganug with the pessimism, enough. Stop with the quetching. Get out there and do something. The Jewish community is not dying. The resources are not diminishing. Yes, there are challenges, of course. Of course there are challenges. But what's this, what's this despair? What's this, you know, krechzing? What's this uh, sensation of giving up? We love it as Jews. Oy, Kevalt, it's a disaster. It's not. Believe in yourselves. Am Hashem, that you have the Torah of Moshe, Torah's Moshe. Pick up the Torah of Moshe and say, if Moshe Rabbeinu took us out of Mitzrayim and split the sea and brought us one from heaven and gave us the Slov and gave us the Torah. And we've been here for three and a half thousand years. Then we are invincible. And yes, we face tremendous challenges and obstacles and God knows what. And Jewish history is not all that pretty. But when a Jew watches his Moshe Rabbeinu climb up the mountain and he knows he'll never see him again, says the Torah, This is the most powerful moment of the day. Seize the power. Seize the power because it's inside yourself. Stop looking. Stop pointing fingers. This one let me down. That one let me down. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. The Jewish people felt let down by Moshe Rabbeinu so many times. When he came, they let them down. When he left, he left. Always let down. At some point, Moshe Rabbeinu said, it's not me. If I've taught you anything in 40 years, then my message stands. Everything I have given you is within you. Why do I say this? I think that as we face Yom Kippur in 2020, as we face the obstacles that are going on in the world around us, and the more I talk to people, people are afraid. People feel threatened. People feel, I dare say it, people feel pessimistic and deflated. So I turn to you, my dear friends, in the words of the Torah, Vayedaber Hashem al Moshe be'etzem hayoyim hazeh. The Torah is here to promise us that the Jewish people, we have within ourselves infinite power. We have an Hashemah, Moshe Rabbeinu is with us, Hashem is with us, that everything, everything is with us. Three and a half thousand years of history is with us. Dare to be optimistic, I dare you. Dare to hold your head high as a Jew, walk around in the street and say, things will be well again. Dare to have faith and be proud. Dare to be strong and say, yes, we need to be responsible. Yes, things around us seem challenging, but the same Rabbi Nashalolim who protected us for three and a half thousand years will continue to do so till the coming of Mashiach and then beyond. Dare to smile. 
dare to do the most difficult thing for a Jew to do. Dare be happy. Dare find reason in life to celebrate and to have gratitude. Dare to embrace it without any obstacles. Yes, even the moment of the passing of, think how much pain, think how much suffering is in this Moshe Rabbeinu climbing up the mountain. He's not coming down this time. Hashem stood there on top of the mountain, on top of Moshe Rabbeinu, on top of the Jews and said, I'm not going to let you turn this into a moment of despair and destruction and pain. I'm not going to let you see this as one more obstacle which you cannot overcome because if that's how you see it, we wasted our time. And everything Moshe Rabbeinu taught us is meaningless. God forbid. Instead, said Hashem, I'm going to tell you the exact opposite. This is the most powerful moment. Release the energy. Find it all. It's, it's, in, it's within yourself. Have no fear. The same Rabbeinu Shalom, the same Moshe Rabbeinu that took us out of all these obstacles in the past, the same Rabbi Nishloel will continue to protect us and provide for us in the future. I dare say the challenge of this year, Tafshin Pei Aleph 55781, the challenge that the Rabbi Nishloel calls upon all of us is not to act irresponsibly. The challenge is not to throw caution to the wind and pretend like there's no coronavirus or pretend like nothing is going on. We have to act responsibly. We have to be reasonable. You know what the challenge of the year is? to embrace this year with optimism, to look forward and to say and to believe and to mean it with a whole heart. This year will be a year of miracles. This year will be a year of redemption. This year will be a year where we overcome things within ourselves that we've struggled with the whole, our whole life. This year will be a year of ecstatic, tremendous joy. Hashem will bless us and our families with unthinkable brachas. This year, say it, feel it, believe it, picture it, look forward to it. Be'etzem hayoyim hazed, the sun is at its brightest. The brachas are as powerful as they come. It's up to us to collect it, to take our heads out of the sand, to let go of things the way we've seen them in the past, and to embrace with Hashem's help with Hashem's help, the future. It was only then, it was only then that the Jewish people were ready to go into Eretz Yisrael. Have a wonderful Shabbos. And if I don't see you before on Yom Kippur, Hashem bless you with the Gemar Simat, bless all of you and all of us with the Gemar Simat Toiva. And a year filled with brachas and simchas and nachas and gesund and gratitude, Yishev Adas, time and peace to enjoy all of Hashem's brachas. Please God, even before Yom Kippur, Mashiach will come and will be reunited with Moshe Rabbeinu and with Aaron Akoy and his brother and with all the tzaddikim from all the generations. And when they come down the mountain three and a half thousand years later, we'll look at them and we'll tell them the truth. We'll tell them, we never forgot what you taught us. Not for one second. Have a wonderful Shabbos.